Hi everybody, I hope you're well. Uh, today I will read from a book titled The Architectural Association in the Post-War Years by Patrick Zamarian, published by Lund Humphries. The Architectural Association, AA, is a fascinating place. It was founded as an independent school at a time when school-based training in Britain was as yet unknown and its history is the history of its struggle for survival as an independent school. This in itself makes it a unique institution in the architectural world. Short-lived pedagogical experiments notwithstanding, all other major schools are rooted in a particular educational system, nowadays mainly the German model of technical universities, in previous eras the French Beaux-Arts system. Driven by an unshakable belief in the superiority of its own approach, the AA has always defined itself against the prevailing methods of training. Its roots lie firmly in itself. Unlike similarly esoteric societies, it has developed and nurtured its own impenetrable customs and myths. Over its long existence, the AA has been a constant point of reference in British architectural education, alternatively eliciting admiration, envy and scorn, but never indifference. I was not born in Britain and did not study here. The indigenous infatuation with the AA's idiosyncrasies has thus uh, largely passed me by. Indeed, with its uh, glorified amateurism and its penchant for eccentricity, the AA always seemed to me to be a perfectly English construct, and like most such things, an acquired taste. Certainly, when I studied architecture at the ETH Zurich in the late 1990s, we had little time for the AA and its fanciful paper visions. We saw the AA as an art academy rather than a school of architecture, and as such it figured fairly low in our estimation. Conditioned by a subliminally anti-artistic Zinglian utilitarism, our interest in the architectural drawing lay solely on its potential as an actual building, and the AA seemed to make no obvious contribution to this. Of course, history proved us wrong on this point. What we could relate to was the AA's hermetic snobbishness and entitlement mentality, common Swiss traits uh, not limited to the ETH but particularly prevalent there. However, in our case, or at least in my case as a Zurich native, exaggerated feelings of self-importance derived largely from the fact that ours was far and wide the only school of any standing. Other architectural schools in small European countries find themselves in similarly dominant positions. TU Delft, the University of Porto, or the major Scandinavian schools being prime examples. And this may offer some explanation why it is often in such countries that we can find something resembling a coherent national attitude towards modern architecture. The situation in Britain could not be more different. Today, there are about 50 validated schools of architecture, a dozen of them in London alone. In the post-war period, there had been 73 such schools, 20 of which, including the AA, offered a full-time five-year course which was recognized by the Royal Institute of British Architects, RIBA, for exemption from its final examination. The AA was thus far from unique. Yet, in spite of this, the school could claim to have produced a quarter of all major competition winners in the post-war period, and while the exact figure may be debatable, the overall success of the school in this respect is not. Beginning with the first significant competition after the war, the Pimlico housing scheme won by Philip Powell and Hidalgo Moya in 1946, AA graduates strung together a succession of similar accomplishments in the following years and decades. Of course, not all distinguished architects came from the AA. Sterling studied at Liverpool, Gowan at Glasgow and Kingston, and the Smithsons in Newcastle. We did not go to the AA. That's why we're good, Alison Smithson reportedly proclaimed. 
Yet, for many others, the AA was high on their wish list and failure to be admitted a cause for regret. Indeed, the list of AEA graduates reads like a who's who of British post-war architecture and includes private practitioners such as Peter Cook, Edward Cullinan, Nicholas Grimshaw, Michael and Patty Hopkins, Robert Maguire, Cedric Price, Quinlan Terry, John Vautclair and Elias Engelis. Many lesser-known but equally influential architects who attained high positions in the public sector also graduated from the AEA. The AEA was for much of the post-war period the country's largest and uh, most eminent school of architecture. How was it possible that an institution whose value as a training ground for practicing architects I dismissed had managed to produce all these architects whose work I admired? Of course, it did not take me long to apprehend that the post-war incarnation of the AA school had been an altogether different entity to the one on which I based my prejudices. Rather more surprising was the realization that nobody had been sufficiently intrigued by the school's tremendous efficacy to investigate the matter in any depth. There has been tentative research into the period leading up to the Second World War, when the students staged a campaign against the school's Beaux-Arts methods, which would, as Elizabeth Darling argues, ultimately secure modernism's domination over British spatial culture. Likewise, the so-called uh, electric decade from the mid-1960s onward, which reached its apex in the early 1970s when Alvin Boyarsky reinvented the school as an intellectual infrastructure for architectural postmodernism, has attracted considerable interest from historians such as Andrew Higgett, Igor Marjanovic and uh, Irene uh, Sangu. Bridging these two landmark events in the AA's history, the two decades from the end of the war until the mid-1960s have received only perfunctory treatment and generated little more than anecdotal evidence. In a compellingly neat narrative, the post-war years emerge as a transitional and largely inconsequential phase during which the pioneering spirit of the pre-war insurgents lay dormant until it evidently stimulated Boyarsky and the new generation of staff and students to salvage the moribund AA from imminent closure. Given the unquestionable success of the school in the post-war period, this seemed a blatantly absurd proposition. Six years ago, I therefore decided to leave my home in Spain and move to England to dedicate my doctoral research to the matter. The book you are holding in your hands is the outcome of this research. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for joining me today and see you in the next video. Bye.